the graveyard. This is your tour of cemetery art and history and symbolism with the gravestone girls. There is indeed an S on the end of gravestone girls. There's more than one of me. I'm Brenda, as Heather introduced. This is a shot of the gravestone girls in our natural habitat. That's me. That is my, uh, that is my web mistress, Melissa. My unconventional conventionalist, Maggie. We all have grown up in Massachusetts. Uh, Melissa out in Western Mass, Maggie and I in Central Mass. And together and separately, we have been traversing graveyards for pretty much all of our lives. Uh, Gravestone Girls' mission is to keep our dead alive by preserving cemetery art and history. Shameless self-promotion website, gravestonegirls.com. We're also on Facebook and Instagram. You also all should have gotten one of these on your seats or picked it up at the back table. This is how you find us again. You can shop online, follow us on social media. Do not leave without them. I want my numbers on social media up tomorrow. <laughs> Um, we do a couple of different things. I do public presentations like this to teach you about what is in these beautiful old spaces. We lead cemetery tours, so today is a virtual tour because it's cold out there. Um, and in the warmer weather, we take walks through the cemeteries and we talk about what we find there in terms of art, geology, history, and symbolism. Um, we teach proper tombstone cleaning and gravestone rubbing classes. Hmm. We also, that being said, there's a lot of misconception about doing gravestone rubbing and cleaning, and I'm not gonna get into that today. The reason that we do it is to dispel a lot of the myths and misinformation around those two uh, very popular and very pertinent things. That being said, uh, I grew up in the family cemetery in Bolton, rubbing colonial New England gravestones. Years go by, I got all these pieces of paper in my two-dimensional gravestone rubbings and I wanted something three-dimensional. So that's what the last thing the gravestone girls do is we create tombstone replicas and this is but an example of the lovelies that we make. Uh, I have art history and restoration education so my collecting and reproduction is done safely and responsibly. I have brought some goodies to shamelessly self-promote out in the back. Um, I bought some, brought some of the small magnets, also brought the new tombstone chocolate. They're all created directly from the faces of original colonial New England tombstones. And everybody's got a history tag on the back that will tell you the name of the person, name and location of the graveyard, plus information about the symbol. So I only brought you the magnets today, but we also make things to hang on the wall, frames, mirrors, coasters, plaques. Um, and again, the chocolate that's brand new has been a great thing to, to delve into. <laughs> Third generation of my family's business. All right, that's enough about the gravestone girls and how wonderful we are. But I'll tell you that all day, don't you worry. Before we get started, we have to answer two basic questions about the origin and the evolution of the cemetery. We have to answer the question of why we bury the dead and where gravestones come from. As as humans, we have a limited amount of time while we're here. So when that life is over, you have to do something with the body. So we dig a grave, we put the grave in the body, and uh, put the grave in the body. <laughs> put the lime in the coffin. We put the body in the grave, and then we cover the, the, that grave with earth. And then stones on top of that. And originally, long ago, it was multiple stones, a pile of stones. So that's where the term gravestone evolves from. And the idea of putting stones on that grave serves a couple of practical purposes. One, well, you know where you put somebody if you want to come back and visit, memorialize. You know where you put somebody so you don't disturb the folks that are already there when it comes time to bury someone else. And that pile of stones on the freshly turned earth of that grave keep the wild animals from disturbing those contents. The archaeological record dating back 50,000 years and more consistently shows around the world in many different civilizations that people believe there was something more after this. There's another world that we go to when we leave here. And we know that by, by something like this. These little things, I've got a very simple burial here. And these little things in here are clay vessels, grave goods. So they are something that the, the deceased 
would need in the next world. They might have carried food, beads, oil, something that was needed by that occupant in the next world. Aren't these big pointy things really just big old gravestones? Mm -hmm. Right? Yep. They mark the spot where Pharaoh is buried and they contain wonderful things that Pharaoh needs in the next world. I can talk about 50,000 years worth of history, no problem. We don't have that kind of time. So I am going to get us to the good stuff. We are going to take our stroll today through the three major eras of uh, graveyard slash cemetery evolution. And there is a difference. And I'm going to show that to you as we walk along. So I'm going to start in the burial grounds of the colonial period from first settlement through the 1700s. We're going to take a peek inside the rural cemetery movement of the 19th century. And then we're also going to take a look at the modern landscapes of the 20th and 21st centuries. Uh, there is an incredible amount of content in here that pertains to Lancaster. I don't live far away. I grew up, I live in Worcester. I grew up in South Braille. I've been in and out of the Lancaster cemeteries many, many times, as Heather said. Um, I've presented before, so I have a lot of local content. That being said, I have local content for uh, modern stuff too. So I'll tell you now and I'll remind you when we get to that section, you may see someone you know when we get to the modern portion of the program. Don't freak out. <laughs> I'm not trying to single anybody out to say this is a good example or a bad example. I'm, I'm using what I find on the modern landscape to show what we as modern people think and feel about mortality and memorialization the same way I use the examples that I find in the colonials and the 19th century to illustrate the people and their belief systems of that time as well. Lancaster, established 1653. Here we are in chronological order. You might be familiar with them. And uh, I believe I have examples from everyone on the list at least once in today's program. When you look at my slides, they'll all have a caption. The first line will tell you what we're looking at and where it is. So if it is from Lancaster, it will say the name of the cemetery or burial ground. If it is from outside of Lancaster, it will indicate as such. But pretty much everything you're going to see today came from Lancaster. Mm -hmm. This is a very traditional colonial New England burial ground. This is the settler's burial ground. How many of you have been here? Right? OK, the rest of you will go afterwards. It's cold, but we'll still have lots of sun. <laughs> so you know that this is an overhill, overdale, down the railroad tracks, into the pine grove kind of thing. So it looks like it's in the middle of nowhere. But it was the original center. Your meeting house was located nearby. And I'm not exactly sure what the impetus for the move was, but at some point it was decided to move the center of town to its current location. Um, to get a charter to build, uh, to establish a town in New England in Mass Bay Colony at the time, you needed to do a bunch of things, including establishing a meeting house and a burial ground, which is why you very much, very often find them in close proximity to each other. When you see these spaces, know what you're looking at has absolutely changed over time. People come in and, and they clean up. They want to change things for aesthetics. Um, as, and if you, if you think of um, settlers here and Old Common, uh, particularly with Old Common, because this is in the middle of the woods, but where roads are put in where there were no roads before, or existing roads are expanded, it eats into that space. As buildings are built around those old colonial burial grounds, it eats into that space. Groundskeeping will affect that space. And one of the nice telltale signs that you see almost everywhere you go, I, I, I hesitate to say 100%, but 99.999, they've been affected by those types of changes. And what you see when you look at these spaces is nice organized rows. They look like your rows of chairs around here. They're not exactly all in line, but they have a definite organized linear pattern to them. Our traditional colonial New England tombstones, uh, two dominant materials, you're familiar with the slates 
here. We've got lots of those here in central New England. So in central Mass, if you go from central Mass to the sea, the majority of material is slate. And if you go from about west of Worcester, the Brookfields and Sturbridge, uh, out to the end of the state and down into the Connecticut River Valley, uh, down into Connecticut, you're going to have sandstones. They're using material that is local and easily accessible. They're not going very far to get this stuff. You gotta go on potentially questionable roads uh, with your horse and cart. You've gotta dig it out of the ground. You gotta put it on the cart. You gotta bring it back to where it's gonna be worked. And then you can start making a tombstone. So they're, like any other building material, they're going to use what's locally available. Gravestones have parts just like anything else. So here we have a, a shoulder. This, where the art is contained is called the tympanum, and then another shoulder here. Below the art is the biographical information, names, dates, locations, perhaps uh, how they died, where they were from, biographical information. And also you can often find early on rough local stone carved into tombstones. They might be very simple if they have anything on them at all. They might be blank. They might have just initials, initials and a date. Pretty simple. Um, what you have in settlers is something that I have not seen almost anywhere else. There's one other place I can think of. So you've got these rough stones like this. And you've got inscription here. And then it's continued on the stone behind it. Fascinating. <laughs> and the way these are put into the ground, these are examples of headstones and footstones. Here's an example of them at the common burial ground. Uh, headstones and footstones. So this is all Christian-based ideology and iconography. They're very religious. They're very superstitious. They're really following the Bible to the letter. And everything you do is, in this world is impacted on the destination of the immortal soul upon your death. That includes the way you're buried. So these are headstones and these are footstones. So the headstone marks the head of the grave. So if you bury father and he's six feet tall, there's a six foot spread between his headstone and footstone. And mother next to him at five feet, five foot spread between her headstone mm -hmm. and footstone. Take that logic, apply it to this picture over the old common, and we can deduce that everybody was all the same height. <laughs> right? You know, right? That you all laugh, you're like, yeah, that's ridiculous. What does that tell you? That tells you that this space has indeed been changed over time. And this is about the right length for the lawnmowers to go through. <laughs> you want me the guy who has to mow around all of that <laughs> stuff? So, they get pushed back, these footstones get pushed back, and they make their own row. They're going to have something in common with the large stone, the parent stone, in the front of it. So if this is my tombstone and it says my name, Brenda P. Sullivan, then this little footstone behind it, or maybe it's that one, looks more like it's in mine, that little footstone would bear my initials or my name, something that ties the big one and the little one together. If they don't match, that's just another visual cue for you that this space has indeed been reorganized. Early colonial tombstones in early colonial New England burial grounds were, were placed in what's fancy called uh, east-west axis orientation. And it's just a fancy way of saying which way they're facing. So what we're looking at here, these are the back sides of the stones. The writing is facing west over there. The body is here, behind the headstone, facing, facing east, or it will be facing east. <coughs> On Judgment Day, the Archangel Gabriel is going to come from the east, and he's going to blow his trumpet, sounding the call to Judgment Day and Resurrection, and all of the dead are going to sit up in mm. their graves, facing east, to meet their maker. Mm. This is an important call. You don't want to miss this call. <laughs> you didn't spend all the time working here under the trials and tribulations of surviving every day of life to be buried the wrong way and either not here 
the sound of Gabriel's trumpet or hear the sound and sit up and go, hey, where is everybody? <laughs> you don't want to be left behind. And this is how uh, religious and uh, superstitious, but also very much uh, strictly adhering to the, to the text of the Bible. So I said they were colonial gravestone symbols, our Christian-based iconography. Uh, it is about the care and feeding of the immortal soul. And the soul is represented on these tombstones early on with a winged skull and later with this winged soul. Early on, we use the idea of the, the bones because that's what's left because you are mortal. At the time, so this is last quarter of the 1600s and into the 1700s, uh, to carve something into stone at this period of time that looked human or angelic would have been biblically considered a graven image and would have been sacrilegious. Mm -hmm. So we do a very literal, literal interpretation of mortality by using the bones. We put wings on that to signify the idea of flying off to the next world. When we get into the 1720s and 30s, there's a, a period called uh, the Great Awakening and there's a backlash against that really strict religious adherence. We still have to take care of that immortal soul through our good deeds, but, but we're allowed, we're currently existing in this time period uh, when there is, where the slightest transgression is not the difference between heading up and heading down. <laughs> You've got a little more leeway to police yourself. You still need to do the good work. And everything you do, both previously, late 1600s into the 1700s, and then from the 1720s forward, is all about getting, doing the good work to be judged favorably in the next world so that soul gets its reward. There is no time, I've just given you these two different cutoffs for time, and it's not, you can't say the wing skull stopped being used in 1732. That's not how it works. Tombstones are made well after the fact. In many cases, they are backdated. In many cases, um, the stone cutter is not just waiting for you to show up to start making a gravestone. They're making blanks, doing the art, and you would pay a price for the tombstone, and then you would pay by the letter to get the text put on it. Certainly, you could commission one from scratch, but that's not always necessary. They're all, they are often ahead of you. Hmm. So these symbols are going to, these, these two soul symbols are going to overlap. I've seen winged skulls right up to the end of the 1700s, and I've seen winged souls that certainly predate this great awakening in the 1720s and 30s. Just a few examples of the lovelies that you have here uh, between settlers and common. And there are many, many more. And they're all lovely. I love each and every one of them. It's like ask, being asked who my favorite cat is. I don't even have one. This is, again, great examples of the winged soul uh, that, that comes in the 1700s, again, at common and settlers' burial grounds all very different. Don't let anybody tell you that the man that this tombstone stands for is that this image is what that man looked like. That's not how it works. Carvers carve over and over in similar styles. They had apprentices that took different style cues from them. Some uh, carvers carved their entire career in one particular style. Others evolved over time. Heather was gracious enough to give me some data to throw in here, and I thought this was really great. I know a little bit about carvers based on, based on style, but this is a nice, nice, neat way to put it all together for at least seven of the carvers doing tombstones that appear on your landscapes mm -hmm. in town. Other souls, again, locally in Lancaster. So I just got finished saying, I can't tell you what my favorite tombstone is. That's definitely one of them. Mm -hmm. Very, very unusual. Two souls, the way I read this is two souls, one on this side passing through and getting to the next world. Mm -hmm. Also done by the Park family. 
four generations working, I believe, out of Broughton, very prolific and just fantastic style. What's this guy doing? Peeking out of the coffin at you. <laughs> this, all of this iconography is messages from the dead to the living about mortality. See me in the ground, you're looking at my tombstone. Mm -hmm. You're going to be here too. <laughs> it is a constant puritanical finger wag about checking your behavior and making sure that you're on the right path through your deeds. Um, this, is, this is on that list from Heather. This is the Wooster family. There was a father and there was a son. They carved this style for the entire duration of their careers, mm -hmm. as far as we can tell. They also have people copy. Everybody has people that copy. So you can look at a stone and determine that this might be this carver, and then you have to go do the work to figure it out. Tombstones in the colonial period were very rarely signed. To put your name on something as a maker was sacrilegious. There's one creator and you ain't it. So if you do genealogy for your family, you do the same kind of processes uh, for research to identify and confirm carvers of New England tombstones from the colonial period. Other symbols besides those soul symbols, this guy is literally peeking out of the coffin. Mm -hmm. He's in a, he's pretty long, he's in a long toe pincher coffin, and he's got a glass, uh, an hourglass next to him. His time has run out, and yours will as well. Um, Stars, six-pointed, eight-pointed, sometimes called hexafoils. They are, uh, if they're interpreted as stars, they are uh, guiding lights from the, the end of the day to the dawn of the next day, uh, with the life bracketed in between. They're also really kind of easy to make if you're a carver, and they fill space up nicely. So there is always a way to interpret these symbols, but it is not ultimate. We have a general understanding and acceptance of them. Crossbones. Do I have a pirate in here? Do we have pirates in my castle? Mm -hmm. So that's a really easily understood symbol even today, right? We use crossbones, we use skull and crossbones to denote the idea of danger. So we use it on things like high voltage and poison. Very easily understood. And here's another lovely with two toe pinchers, mm -hmm. toe pincher caskets laying on their sides, in between the hourglass, under the wing swell. We've got pictures on the stones to speak to the population that can't read and write. We've got writing on the stones to speak to the population that can read and write, but maybe they don't stop all the time to every day to read these symbols, to, to read these written messages, which is, again, we fall back on the symbols. And we very often will see Latin on the stones as well. Latin is a, a, an early language in Christianity. We got to make sure that we get everybody, the super educated, the read and writes, and the, the folks that were illiterate. Memento mori means think on death. Remember your mortality. This is a beautiful stone with a wonderful Latin phrase across the top. Even in the 21st century, I don't need to know how to read Latin mm -hmm. to understand the picture that's represented on this stone. Here's a tree. You're the tree. Human lives are like trees. They have a definite beginning. They have a definite end. And that life is fragile and can be interrupted unexpectedly at any moment. So you're the tree and you got up today and you thought you were going to have a normal day and go about your business. And out of the clouds, comes your maker with his hatchet, and he felled your tree. Mm. Mm. Hope you were ready. <laughs> you didn't see it coming. Hope you did the good work along the way, because now the chances of the opportunities to do those good works are over. But not to worry. Death is not a permanent condition up here. So that's from settlers. That's Connecticut. And this is out in Oxford. Up here, across the top of this stone, says the grave is God's hiding place. The grave is God's waiting room. We're just kind of hanging out in between this world and the next because we're waiting for something. We're waiting for this. Resurrection. So the call of Gabriel's trumpet on Judgment Day, signaling the call to resurrection, to be redeemed of your sins, and hopefully ascend to the next world to get your reward. 
So all kitty cats, ice creams, and unicorns mm -hmm. after this really difficult and trying world. That handsome devil is my boyfriend. <laughs> and his death it is also mortality. This is over in Concord, and it says, all must submit to the king of terrors. Death was known as the king of all terrors. All must submit. Nobody gets out of here alive. You may recognize that from uh, any number, or I can think of one particular uh, 20th century rock song. Um, that's great. They knew that, and then putting it in music in the, in the 60s, well, they knew that 300 years ago or more. As we come to the end of the 1700s, there's a lot of change happening. We have the revolution. We have the founding fathers that come together to try and, and develop the ideology that this new nation is going to be governed on, governed by, and, and based on. So they are, they look to the classical civilizations of the Greeks and the Romans, the, the civilizations that were founders of the concept of democracy and the republic. The idea of the people governing themselves. And while they're doing all that pontificating over here, there's real-time archaeology going on all across Greece and Europe. Egypt, Napoleon is in Egypt. Um, we're taking the grand tour to go across and see these ancient civilizations <coughs> coming out of the ground. And they are, they are showing the modern people of the time as we move into the 19th century, they're showing the modern people of the time these ancient civilizations that were strong and successful and that we will model ourselves on. One of the many things that comes to light from these excavations is the cinerary urn. It's a beautiful one from, this is from North Burial Ground, I believe. I love that little explosion coming out of the top of that. So it's a cinerary urn, and what a perfect symbol to use on modern tombstones. It is the vessel that carries the body to the next world. It is newly founded, it's based in ancient tradition, and it's a perfect modern symbol to, for the land of the dead because we have, the, we have adopted all of these other classical influences in the land of the living. So when we do that, it's called neoclassicism. It turns up in our architecture, in our furniture, in our style of dress. We're making a complete break from the folks of the, of the um, colonial period. More trees. This is a very specific tree that starts turning up on these stones. It's a weeping willow. And by, version of, by virtue of the way it looks and its name, it is a perfect <coughs> symbol for sorrow and mourning. I remember in the, the last slide I showed you with the tree, I said that trees were like human lives that are easily interrupted, that life ending. See the split in the tree here? So that's the interruption in life, but look what's coming from that split. There's new life, a next life that's going to come from that. The interruption and the end of life in this world. So we'll have the urn by itself and the willow by itself very common 19th century symbols, and we have them also, they come together to be the urn and the willow, the idea of something dead and something living, a beginning and an end. These become the dominant symbols as we move through the 1800s, and all of those older symbols that were considered so primitive have gone by the wayside. A full shot here of my urn and willow. So metaphorically, this is terra firma here. So this is everything above ground. This is all, uh, this is all uh, allegory. Uh, I've got my columns over here. This is how we pass through the gate of the burial ground. It is also the entrance to the tomb, as well as the portal to the next world. This looks really different, doesn't it? So what happens in 1831, this is Mount Auburn Cemetery. So this is the first time a place where we bury our dead in this country is called a cemetery. And even the word cemetery derives, is derived from a Greek word that, re, that means a sleeping place or dormitory. And all of that really reflects who we as modern people of the 19th century what we're thinking and feeling about mortality and memorialization. 
So we're moving from the farms, we're coming into the cities, we're working in the factories. Those factories are making life easier, comparatively. Um, we're able to get goods faster. We're able to not spend every day just trying to survive. And we want to make a statement about who we are as modern people in the land of the living, in the land of the dead. So this, who's been to Mount Auburn? Okay, after we do the, through the fields over to settlers, we'll go to Mount Auburn after that. Just there yesterday, as a matter of fact. So Mount Auburn Cemetery takes its cues from Père Lachaise Cemetery in Paris. It also takes its cues from the, uh, from the English garden movement of the time, and it puts them together. You'll see here, established in 1831 by the Massachusetts Horticultural Society. So not only is this going to be a place where we bury the dead, this is also going to be a test arboretum and continues as a, a certified arboretum to this day. Everything's different. We've got green grass, rolling hills, pathways to walk. Our monuments are different. Material, uh, our monuments are different shapes, sizes, and material. This is reflecting, again, the change to industrialism. Industrialism. It is reflecting what we are thinking about nature. So our, uh, our authors of the time, the Hawthorns, the Thoreaus, uh, Byron, they, they're talking about preserving nature, going out and engaging with nature. The spiritualists and the transcendentalists are, have a hand in this landscape because of the idea of communing not only with nature, but communing with the dead. The, what the, the veil between this world and the next is very different. It, it's very close. All of these things come together to give us this new rural garden cemetery. And it catches on super quick. Uh, everybody starts doing it. And this, when Mount Auburn opens, it becomes a tourist attraction. And it is because no one in this country has seen something like this before, but also it is open green space four miles outside of downtown, filthy, industrialized 19th century Boston. Hmm. So everybody starts doing this. Here's St. John's in the super early spring. I mean, I think maybe you've noticed I've been in your town at any number of different seasons. And it's the same thing. I've got pathways. I've got different shapes and sizes of materials in my monuments. I've got a lot of trees. This is a beautiful place in the spring. It's a beautiful place in the summer and the fall. And even though stark, it's beautiful in the winter as well. In these newfangled cemeteries, we have, the first, for the first time, the opportunity to purchase a plot of land, a family lot, a family plot. So we might do things to show that this is our home away from home. <coughs> I've got corner markers here, and there would be two in the back side. Sometimes we put walls, foundations <coughs> up. And that idea of home away from home, the family all lives together here, and one by one, as someone passes, they go to these family lots, and the family is all reunited together. So if, if I have a family lot, and here's one, here's another, and another, and another, and another, all of a sudden now, I've got a neighborhood. And these cemeteries of the 19th century were very active social spaces. People were coming in very regularly to, to uh, plant flowers, to tend the graves, to visit <coughs> with the dead, to visit with the living neighbors, to commune with nature. This was a very, very social space. Much softer symbols. Wheat, the idea of the end of the harvest. Um, I've got a nod here to, to uh, military service. I've got a wreath of laurel with the sword. I know that doesn't look like it, but that's a lamb, mm -hmm. oh. right? And we'll talk about marble for just a minute. I warned you, I can do this all day. So <laughs> I could spend 45 minutes just here. And here's my beautiful, and yet a bit melty, um, my visitor, my companion, uh, someone praying to, to stay, uh, someone to stay and watch over that immortal soul, your own, your own mourner. And remember, this is the Victorian period, so everything's very emotional and fancy. 
Uh, everything has a meaning. So the, the stone we saw for the colonials, those slates and sandstones, gives way to marble with these newfangled cemeteries because we have the ability to get material from farther away. It's chosen because it's white, it's bright, it's symbolic all by itself of purity uh, and light and of heaven. Problem is, not very weather resistant. Mm -hmm. So even though these markers are younger than what we've seen in the colonial period, they're much worse for the wear because of their geological makeup. Very susceptible to uh, wind and water erosion, uh, as well as pollutants in the air. So at one time, that lamb actually looked like a lamb. It had ears, it had eyes, it had a nose, it doesn't look like a lamb. Much softer symbols move these nods to nature, like trees, like the trees that we have. We also have flowers, the flower that buds, <laughs> blooms, and the bloom that fades. If you see stones like this, again, man down, but there he is, with a little, just a little bud, it's most often for small children, sometimes young women as well, childhood mortality very high right through the end of the 1800s. <coughs> the idea of that flower that starts as a bud, but the bud that never gets the opportunity to bloom, the idea of being nipped in the bud. That's stone. It looks like a tree. That looks like a tree. That looks like a tree. But they're all stone. Made to give that nod to nature, that idea of the fragility of life, and also to be part of the natural landscape. If you're looking for me, hmm. this is where I'm going. No one that knows me believes that. <laughs> no one. I bet Heather's back there laughing like, yeah. <laughs> So this pointing finger is absolutely no different than the winged skull we saw on the colonial stone. It points the way to the next world, and it promises that there's something else after this. This is the way to go, and we'll all be reunited. Goodbye in this life, hello in the next life. We saw flowers on the, on the previous slide. I've got a, a lovely batch of flowers here, and the hand coming down from the sky to pick those flowers. So very similar to that hand with the hatchet, but much softer and a more modern symbol. I told you about words and geology and symbols and direction and all this kind of stuff. I meant every word of it. I also want you to remember to look down. At the bottoms of the stones, very often, you will find information. So what this is, you can see how it's nice and clear here and then rough down here. This line is where the stone would have been originally set at grade. What happens over time with the freeze and the thaw cycles that we have here, they shift and they move. And a lot of times, that stuff that wasn't meant to be seen comes to light. They might be prices. They might be practice. Leathering. Um, you know, you're not going to let your apprentices work on all the good stones, so you're going to practice first down below. Um, and so this is firmly a 19th century stone down below that grave and, and would have been set at, at the, to be able to be seen. There's a signature. There's a signature from the Park family. So previously in the colonial time, it was sacrilegious to sign something, but now we're in more modern people of the 19th century. We have the ability to basically put a calling card. Go, oh, I like that. Let's go see the parks. They'll make me a stone. Um, and I, I loved, I loved this. Um, this is over in the, when I took this picture. This is over in the common. Um, and seven, it's somebody that came that's a descendant, and uh, Josiah Whitcomb was a seventh great grandfather. So you're never really sure what you're going to find when you're out and about. I want you to know about these because you've got this over in the common. This is called a hill tomb. Very difficult vocabulary. It's a tomb built into a hill. This is a community one because it's built in like this and it shares the, the land, but each one is a separate chamber. They're all closed up. Some are bricked up. Um, some of the iron doors have been welded shut. I know I tried. 
<laughs> um, they may or may not still have remains in them. They typically get closed up over time to keep Snoopy noses out, um, to keep the occupants safe, uh, or they might be removed by family and put somewhere else in, a, in another lot or in another cemetery. Um, and they, they may also be closed up. If there's no one caring for these spaces, they do need care. If, if you know, with all the heaves and hoes of the, of the ground from all our changing weather, without maintenance, these can become unsafe. Mm -hmm. So if somebody's overseeing the burial ground, and these are in cemeteries as well, so they're, they're also a 19th century feature on the landscape. If someone is caring for these spaces and sees that there is no maintenance going on or that it becomes unsafe, that's also another reason why they might be closed up. I need you to know about these. That's a sign if I ever heard one. <laughs> it's a sign, lady, it's three o'clock. Uh, I've still got a little ways to go and I'll try to, try to keep it brief, but I want you to know particularly, I, I want you to know about all of this stuff, but I want you to know about this because it's over in St. John's, it's over in, in, in your, your burial ground, uh, in your cemetery. It's called, these are two different ones, it's called White Bronze. They're made by the Monumental Bronze Company in Bridgeport, Connecticut, and they are neither white nor are they bronze. The company formed as a, a way to be in direct competition with stone monuments. They wanted to do something fancy and newfangled, so they molded these. Hmm. So they're this kind of blue-gray, they're not bronze, they're zinc. Zinc is a natural biocide, so it doesn't grow any, any biological. So no algaes, no mosses, no lichens. The company used the term white bronze to differentiate it from bronze that was very popular on the cemetery landscapes at the time. So doors, vases, plaques, statuary. Bronze is beautiful. Bronze is expensive. Bronze is a visual cue to everybody that, hey, I got some money. Problem with bronze is it needs maintenance. And without maintenance, that beautiful bronze color becomes black and gray and green and streaky and really quite un unnice, un unpleasant. So you have to do maintenance. So Monumental Bronze Company is capitalizing on the cachet of the word bronze, but they're saying ours is different. We don't need any maintenance. It'll look just as good in 100 years as it does the first day it turns up on the landscape, which is totally true. No showrooms for these. You saw them in situ in the burial grounds, in the cemeteries, and you had somebody that traveled with a design book. So they're very customizable. So another modern feature of the time. Now that you know what they look like, when you see these on the landscape, you will never not be able to see them. They stick out, and when you go visit one of them, because I know you're all going to do that this <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> Tomorrow's a holiday, not all day. Go over and just knock on it. If somebody answers, run. <laughs> but more likely what will happen is it's going to turn a hollow, return a hollow metallic sound. There is no armature in these. They're completely hollow. All of those panels had been welded together to create the monument you see on the landscape. Um, they're, in, they're in business from the mid-1800s to the 19-teens. If you see a lot of them in town, you had a good salesman, you had a concept that caught on. If you don't see a lot of them, you didn't have a salesman, and if you did, maybe not a very good one. Um, they are, they are, uh, they really kind of wind down during the First World War because the material and the factory space is needed for the First World War effort. Looks really different, right? Mm -hmm. Modern cemetery of the 21st, 20th and 21st centuries now start looking like this. We have modern medicine. We cheat death on a regular basis. I used to say, you need a kidney? I can give you one. Now I say, you need a kidney? Hang on, they'll print you one real soon. Mm -hmm. We are cheating death on such a regular basis because we have all kinds of things that they didn't have as we come to the close, right up to the close of the 1800s. They didn't understand how you got sick 
how disease was passed, that if your food isn't kept well, it will make you sick. And if it makes you sick, drink a lot of water so you don't dehydrate and die. They didn't have antibiotics. You get a cut today, is it going to kill you? No. <laughs> antibiotic on it and you go on your own way. So at the end of the 1800s, science is, uh, medicine is moving from being art to being science. We understand all of these things and it comes into play to help us extend our lives. Another thing that's happening after the Civil War, uh, funerals start moving out of the house. So we start embalming some of the bodies that are coming out of the Civil War casualties and that starts something new and we combine it with the idea that because of modern medicine we stop dying at home we die in facilities we die other places we don't bathe and dress our dead we don't wake our dead in our own homes anymore we don't we don't have funerals in our homes anymore we've given that job to the funeral director and we take that conversation with our mortality out of our daily lives. We give it to somebody else, we, we decide that it's not pleasant to talk about, and isn't the undertaker's job to give us back our beloved that, that looks just like they're sleeping, right? to look as, as alive as possible. So all of those things come into play to change this landscape. Groundskeeping changes this landscape. We need to be able to keep it pretty, efficiently because of time and money. There's a backlash against all that high ornamentation that was the Victorian period. We have the arts and crafts movement that comes in at the beginning of the 1900s, simplifies the land of the living in our dress, our architecture, and our furniture, and influences the space as well. We want to make it more pastoral. We want to make it easier on the eye rather than that very busy visual that is the 19th century Victorian cemetery. We've got new material as well because we have better technology. We have better tools. We can use granite for not just big, impressive buildings, but for more, no, more mundane, more daily uses, such as tombstones. Uh, granite comes from the molten core of the earth. It's incredibly hard. But with, with steam-powered and water-powered tools, we're now able to harvest this material and transport it more easily than in the past, so it becomes the material for the new modern gravestones. This is the part where I warn you in the next two slides you may see somebody you know. Mm -hmm. I have tried to keep identities out of it, but you know, art is art, so you might recognize somebody. <clears throat> when I go into these modern landscapes, I don't, early on, I didn't really get to meet anybody the way I can when you go into a colonial burial ground or a 19th century cemetery. We have these big tablets that might have the family name on it and the individual names and a year of birth and a year of death and not a whole lot much more going on in between. The good news is, is somewhere right around that, I call it the, in the 1980s, we decided to take that narrative back and we wanted to talk about who we were. So we start putting that on the faces of the stones Black granite becomes a very popular tombstone material, which really lends itself to putting pictures. These three, these three are all done, they're etchings on black granite. So they're done by very talented people with diamond tip tools that put pictures and color mm. into tombstones. So now I can walk in and I can meet people. I can tell what you look like. I can put a face with a name of somebody that I would never have, maybe never have met before. I can see what we did. We served our community, both here and the fire department, as well as the police. I can see, this is, I think this is a great profession, to be able to say, I, I need to figure out how to interpret that picture so that on my tombstone it can, I can look that good and I know he's a magician, I want somebody to be able to look at that and go, she was a gravestone girl. <laughs> but you know, this, these are the things we did. Um, we talk about our nationality. Our, 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 our nationality is our identity. So there's a Celtic cross under here, so I would be able to say, hey, bet I'm going to find an Irish surname on that. And this was around St. Patrick's Day, so they come out and put the put the shamrock on to further that Irish identity. Um, 
So I told you about the etchings. This is called the photoceramic. So it's a, a piece of ceramic, sometimes of porcelain, that an emulsion process happens to that piece of ceramic to put the photo on it. Do you remember um, developing photos? Right? Actually developing photos. It's the same kind of emulsion process. Instead of putting it on paper, we're putting it on ceramics. So again, I can see the faces of people that I probably existed contemporaneously with, but didn't have a chance to physically meet. So I can see who we are. We also put on there to show the things that we enjoyed. Mm. I see your pets. I see your pets a lot. <laughs> pets are just so much a part of the family. Uh, I can, I can see what we did in our spare time. Uh, we're New Englanders, we love putting lighthouses on tombstones. I can even see where you lived, where your favorite happy places were. <laughs> That's a photo ceramic. Mm. Uh, it's, nothing says I'm a sports fan like putting it on your tombstone, right? <laughs> right? We really can get a feel for who these people were as individuals. In these modern cemeteries of the 21st century, we're doing a lot of stuff. There's a long list, and that's not everything. So we're doing things like beekeeping. We're, we're bringing our gardeners in, the, asking volunteers to help beautify the spaces. I know this makes everybody in New England shriek, but dog parks are a thing in cemeteries outside of New England. Huh. All, almost all of this stuff is a thing in cemeteries outside of New England, because mm. we're just as puritanical as when we got here 400 years ago. <laughs> Weddings and parties. I will go to a party in the cemetery, legit, rather than just not supposed to be there having a party at night. <laughs> Weddings and parties. They have beautiful landscapes. They have chapels and, and beautiful properties on the cemetery landscape that you can, you can use to do something special for your occasion. Um, plenty of time to go to dinner and a movie in the cemetery. You can practice yoga. What a more peaceful place than in the cemetery to practice yoga. Um, 5K runs, they in many places will invite you in in the evening to go stargazing amongst the tombstones. Book clubs, death cafes where we get together and talk about death, mortality. We try to put that subject back on the table and take the fear and the trepidation out of it. It's inevitable. It ain't pleasant. I don't want to die. I like it here. Mm -hmm. But it's going to happen, so we should learn to deal with it more as part of our existence. That's me, hawking my wares. <laughs> See that? See all those tombstones around me? That's Laurel Hill Cemetery in Philadelphia. I go down there every year for one day of the year for the Market of the Macabre. And there's a whole bunch of offbeat artists like myself set up in this beautiful 19th century rolling hill cemetery full of beautiful art. <laughs> and we sell our stuff. Probably does. One day a year, goes from 12 to 5. They have upwards of 3,000 visitors come, <gasps> paying at the gate to come in. All of this stuff. All of this list that I just said, and more, brings money to the cemetery. Mm. They need it. The grass ain't going to mow itself. And the more you invite the living in to enjoy these spaces, the safer those tombstones and landscapes are. The bad stuff happens by those people that are going to commit vandalism and theft. They're going to target the places that, that are not well-loved and, and well-visited <coughs> You know what that is. Before the pandemic, I, have to, I used to have to explain what a QR code was, but I think we all know this now. The last thing on my list is technology. We're modern people. I got a cell phone. We all got a cell phone. I asked you to end, silence your cell phone. I, I can't get anywhere without this. Get an email. Navigation, I run my business, all of that. We're modern people. I get the weather, everything, everything. So as modern people, the burial grounds, the cemeteries are doing things like making mobile apps. You want to go on a tour? You want to do it on your own time? There's an app for that. 
and gives you and allows you to really <coughs> dig deep in many cases into the history that you might not get as much exposure to if you went uh, with a, a group on a timed wall. Mm -hmm. And QR codes, so we don't even have to type those, those apps in anymore, right? We just scan it. So this is called a memory medallion. It's right there on the stone. Mm -hmm. It's only about an inch in diameter. Mm -hmm. It is created by the, uh, the memory medallion company in Pennsylvania that holds the US patent for using QR technology for memorialization. So I buy my little memory medallion. I have it installed on my stone. Somebody's coming through the cemetery with their cell phone, and they see it, and they scan that code, and they're taken to your website. Mm. Wow. 999 spaces to do anything you want. Post your pictures, post your writings, post your rewards, post your poetry, post whatever you want that makes you you. You can leave a long legacy through technology. And now I can really go into the cemetery and meet people. So this is Mrs. Sarah Buchanan. When you scan the QR code, she is, it comes to this at Memory Medallion. She is the spokesmodel. And we know all kinds of stuff about her, including things like shades of blue are her favorite colors and daisies are her favorite flowers. Mm -hmm. Well, that's fabulous. But she was known apparently for a lot of things in her life. She lived a good long, she lived a good long time. And one of the things that she seems to have been well known for was the famous family caramel recipe. <laughs> there is a 14 minute video <laughs> on her memory medallion site. Her in the kitchen with her adult son showing us how to make the famous family caramel recipe. Mm -hmm. Able to leave something about who you were basically mm -hmm. in perpetuity. Because this technology also evolves. Don't think it doesn't. Memory medallion is there. This is actually that memory medallion is actually their second generation. So it is the ability to keep that information available even with changes in technology. Wouldn't you love to have that for some of the really old right? ones? Absolutely. Next will be holograms, just so you know. <laughs> um, I made a, a, I'm a sassy Massachusetts girl, so I made a comment earlier that all that modern stuff doesn't apply to us in New England. It's true. You're not going to a beer tasting or a, a, a candlelight dinner in a community mausoleum anywhere in the New England cemeteries. I would know, because I would be there. You're certainly not going to markets there either. Um, I gave this presentation to the New England Cemetery Association one year for their annual meeting. I got 100 cemeterians in the room. And I said, all right, you are my test group. How, by a show of hands, how many of you have a memory medallion in, in your cemeteries? How many hands do you think I got? No. Zip. <laughs> no. None. And it, it really does speak to the idea that we still view these spaces as, as uh, non-commercial or, or sacred or whatever you want to call it. When you get outside of New England, they are having parties and 5Ks and fireworks and <laughs> you name it, they're doing it. And it, it merely makes, I'm working very hard to try to get some of these things to happen here. I'll figure it out. I lose it. <clears throat> That's us. Huh. Two of us, anyway. On, on a wonderful day, fairly long ago, um, over in Old Settlers. It is a favorite place. Anytime anybody wants me to take them to a cemetery, particularly if they're out of town, I share this one with them because it's really special. Um, is this Lancaster? Yes, it is. Okay. Yes, it is. This oh, is the old settlement of Barry. So here's the is a favorite picnic spot, but they don't want you to go there anymore. But I, I grew up in, in Lancaster and yes. two houses down the floor. You actually have to go through Evergreen and, Cemetery and, and, to get down to it. Did yeah. you notice uh, was it last year they took all the trees down in Evergreen? Why? Wow. We were there while the machinery was in there. We went in on a Saturday. And we went in while all that gigantic machinery was in there taking down trees. It was fascinating. So I warned you I could do this 
all day and all night. I have well, we started late, I well ran over. I'm still happy to take questions. I know you have a, a meeting to get to uh, as well. There's still plenty of snacks. Take, make sure you get your postcards. Find Grace Jones Girls again, shop online, follow us on social media. My thanks to the Historical Society. My thanks so much to Heather for being such a great supporter of Gravestone Girls and having us back periodically to share our new finds with you. We tend to think that these spaces don't change and, and they stop having things to tell us, but they are always able to tell us something new. So my thanks, enjoy the rest of your day. Go explore your cemeteries near and far. Uh, any questions, I'll take them. Also, email anything you need at any time of the day or night. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.